the Wildlife Observer Network. All right. Well, uh, welcome to the Wildlife Observer Network, uh, Nature's Hype Man. Um, I'm your host, Tony Crozell, with Dr. Robert Rockwell. And you want to be referred to as Rocky still? Yep. So, Dr. Uh, Robert Rockwell or Rocky, either one. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you are well known for your studies on snow geese and now polar bears. I did a field season with you in 2004. It was uh, one of the most amazing um, life-changing experiences of my life. And um, you spoiled me because the next field season I did in Alaska was not nearly as fun. <laughs> Um, it's working for you, and um, it, but uh, it was it was great. Um, so, if you want to get us started, um, uh, where, uh, you know where are you now, and where did you start? Right. So you're. I know you're at, at City University of New York. Um, how did you end up running one of the longest field camps in the in the Arctic? If I, longest running field camp. Uh, yeah, it's one of the longest term projects in the world. <clears throat> and um, so I'm at City University, and I'm also an adjunct at the, or a research associate at the American Museum of Natural History, which is my real home. I don't operate out of City College at all. I teach all my classes at the museum, and the students enjoy that. They get a lot of, a lot of good stuff out of it. Um, I started this when I was in graduate school. I got interested in a very simple question having to do with um, gene flow, and originally, the snow geese are divided into a white form and a blue form. <clears throat> For a while, they thought they were two separate species. And we had some, I worked on some modeling <clears throat> that basically asked the question of, if you have two different color morphs like that, and they positively assort, like white birds only mate with white birds and blue birds only mate with blue birds, then eventually they will become two species. But we had data showing that that isn't exactly the way snow geese play the rule. White geese would prefer a white goose, and a blue goose prefers a blue goose. But, call of nature being what it is, if there's not a white goose and you're blue, hey, uh, that works. And so there was a certain amount of mixing between the two forms. And I was interested in that from a theoretical perspective and needed data. And so I teamed up with a guy that was doing the field work. And uh, that's how we started. That's how the whole snow goose program that you were, you were involved with began. And once I got up there and got into the Arctic, I became much more interested in the dynamics of the snow geese per se, population growth rate, reproductive success, all of that sort of stuff, uh, the population dynamics. And then one of the things that became clear is that the snow goose population was growing uh, way faster than anybody anticipated. And it was doing so because originally the snow geese were winter limited. They uh, spent their winter on the Spartina marshes and the Gulf Coast of, of Louisiana and Texas. And there's only so much forage. And they were over consuming that and that was limiting the population along with hunting pressure. Well, snow geese are not stupid as you realize and remember from being up there around them. And it was sort of like, well, it's dinner time. There's no Spartina left. Ah, what was that green stuff about 10 miles inland? Ooh, that's called rice. That's pretty darn good. And so the snow geese spread into the rice prairies. And once they got into agricultural areas, they just kept moving north for the wintering grounds. And we now have snow geese that winter all the way, all the way into Iowa and Nebraska, where they feed on waste grain because um, grain is harvested, corn is harvested in particular using shuller pickers. And there's always some spillage. So those corn kernels are spilled and the snow geese just go along, and eat them one after the other. And then the other thing, of course, a goose has to have to be happy is they need some water to stand in and drink and play in once in a while. Well, in Nebraska and, and Iowa, Kansas, that whole area, there are a lot of um, power plants that have cooling ponds. So they run the water out there and let it cool naturally. So I've got great pictures that people have sent me of snow geese standing in these steamy water ponds. So it's sort of like they go out and eat waste grain and then they go to the hot tub. <laughs> and as a consequence, what was once a winter limited species was no longer winter limited. It basically had an infinite capacity. And the population started growing at 10% a year. 
which is an astronomical rate. I only wish my retirement grew at that. <laughs> um, I would be very well off. <laughs> but um, what we finally found is that they were overpowering the tundra. Uh, the tundra is basically delicate little graminoids that they eat. And snow geese, when they just graze them, that's fine because they're graminoids, so they have basal meristem. And the geese don't eat them below the meristem, so they would come back. But when you have too many geese, they take that serrated beak that snow geese have and that they're well known for grabbing a hold of people with. Your love you handle specifically. Not yours, but uh, you don't really have them. But I <laughs> yeah. I, like, not yeah, like I did. You, you remember just how powerful those beaks are. Yeah. So they would jam those beaks down into the mud and grab a divot of graminoids by the roots and rip it out. Sort of win and doubt, rip it out philosophy. And what we noticed was the tundra was starting to get quite degraded. And at that time, enter into the picture um, a botanist from, from the University of Toronto, the late Robert Jeffries, who studied the plants with me. And initially, I viewed graminoids as goose food, and he view, viewed geese as lawnmowers. Mm -hmm. And he was interested in the dynamics of the plants and I the geese. And we ultimately came to realize that what we were really studying was a community ecology program. And for many years until Bob passed away, we studied the, the whole system from that perspective, uh, the interaction between the geese and the, and the graminoids. And um, that was very productive. We trained lots of students. We had lots of fun. We learned lots of stuff. And then um, as time passed, one of the things that became very clear to me is you know, the snow geese aren't growing quite as rapidly here as one would anticipate. Why not? It's not because they don't have food, because what they did was they learned subsequent to you being there, that there are all of those freshwater sedge meadows that are one, two, three, even 10 miles inland, and that you can make a living very nicely uh, eating carrots quadalus, areophorum, and things like that. And so the snow geese jumped that barrier and they were no longer food limited in the north. Well, what's limiting? Well, if you think about an ecosystem, then you've got bottom-up regulation, which would be not having enough food, and you have top-down regulation, which is something's eating the herbivore. And ah, well, one of the things that's very common in in the Hudson Bay region of the Arctic are polar bears. Um, I'll, I'll, and so, I'll never forget um, when you interviewed me for this position. I asked you, if I come up with you, will I see a polar bear? And you just cracked up. <laughs> I was like, will you see a polar bear? <laughs> so that was, yeah. Oh, yeah, we, we have plenty of those. But what I started doing was I started studying the predators in general. So the predators on snow geese, their eggs and their goslings are an array of species that include polar bears, obviously. And now a larger number of grizzly bears that have moved in, uh, black bears that have moved north with climate change, uh, wolves, Arctic and red fox, and um, one of the other, and then of course the gulls and the Jaegers, eagles. Um, the one that was really surprising to me were sandhill cranes. Sandhill oh, wow. cranes are, are very effective predators of snow geese. They eat the goslings and they just run along in their gawky way and grab a gosling that's fleeing and sort of toss it up in the air and down the gullet it goes. Oh, wow. So I started studying the whole suite of predators. And about that same time, a grad student approached me named Linda Gormazano. And she was interested in a slightly different take. She was interested in passive sampling and she wanted to use that to estimate abundance of mammal populations. And she wanted to do it by looking at their scat. And the idea was that um, when you have a bowel movement, you have the epithelial lining of your intestine is the same as on your skin. So it sloughs off. So every time you have a bowel movement, you lose some of your cells inside. And those cells, of course, they're dead, but they contain DNA. So the catch is, well, how do you find it? You know, you, you can wander along the tundra and you can find the occasional pile of polar bear poop. Um, but she needed large samples. So what she did was she trained a Dutch shepherd to find polar bear poop. 
Uh, this was actually a quite hysterical adventure because we needed samples to train him. So I had to contact friends in Churchill to collect polar bear poop for me and ship it south. Wow. And of course, we, we get north and it's quite a hysterical scene in the town when they met the dog and a couple of my native friends were going like, really, you train your dog to find poop? I beat hell out of mine when he does. <laughs> and they, they couldn't believe that this dog's job was to find poop. And during the, the three years that we had quinoa, the Dutch shepherd with us, he found over 1,200 piles. And Linda was able to genetically identify some of most of those. And more importantly, it turns out that when you try to set up the um, assay to do the DNA sequencing, um, what else is in the poop can interfere with it. And my wife, who's a molecular biologist, help Linda figure that out. So what Linda had to do was literally go in and dissect out all of the poops and cross classify them according to, is this one that's full of seal? Is this one full of caribou? Is this one full of berries? Is it full of fish? And so on and so forth. Because as you might imagine, each of those can, can drastically alter the chemistry of the reaction system, especially if you have fruit involved, which we discovered that bears, polar bears, eat massive amounts of fruit. Um, so she started doing that and she published several papers on the diet of polar bears. And we were just getting to the point of doing a lot of the genotyp genotypic work on the, the poop and on hair that we were collecting, passively shed hair in their day beds, when she very unfortunately passed away. Oh. So that sort horrible. of brought it in into that work because I I've not found anyone. I have a colleague at University of North Dakota who broke the key, broke how to do it and how to genotype the hair because the hair that we collect doesn't have follicles. And uh, unfortunately, it costs the, the cost of doing it is prohibitive. We we've, we've not been able to get the money to do it. We've got uh, I imagine probably. 2,000 hair samples over a five-year period scattered all along the coast of Hudson Bay. And I imagine we've got upwards of 1,000 samples, maybe 2,000 samples. And they cost about 250 bucks a sample to run. So that is just prohibitive. It's not that the sequencing is costly, but it's the extraction process because this is not follicular hair. This is just like the dead hair that you shed. So there's DNA bound up inside a collagen coat, and it's really hard to get to. And you have to, if, you, if you're very abrasive on it, then you destroy the DNA. So you have to be gentle and strong at the same time, and that's the trick. So that got me into the polar bear stuff. And sub subsequent to that, I've been much more interested in their, their dietary habits, their distribution along the coast. And currently, um, we're very involved with um, a grizzly bear biologist trying to figure out uh, what really happens when a polar bear meets a grizzly bear. And as you might imagine, it turns out that it depends on who's what size. Mm. A male polar bear is always going to be, a, an adult male polar bear at 1,200 pounds is going to pull about 400 pounds over an adult male grizzly. But you have juveniles, you have females of both species. And so far we have found we have found grizzly bears that have killed and eaten polar bears. We have found polar bears that have killed and eaten grizzly bears. Um, unlike Alaska, Koktovik is the only other place on earth where you have polar bears and grizzly bears. And there are actually pictures there of them feeding side by side, species by species, on the remains of bowhead whales. Um, we haven't seen anything like that in the Churchill region, um, whether it's because our polar bears or our grizzly bears are more aggressive. Um, we don't know. We're trying to sort that out. And as you might imagine, a lot of that is just casual observation. We go out as when you were there and we stomp the tundra or uh, spend a little more money and, and fly the coast with helicopters. And when you see them, uh, you sort of go way up in the air so that you can observe them without disturbing them. And we've seen some, some really grand interactions where a uh, polar bear had pulled this very nice beluga calf out and was feeding on it. And this grizzly bear came slowly inching up, trying to get closer and closer. 
like I'll, I'll only eat at this end and you can have the other end. It was a, um, I was gonna, I would say a young grizzly bear, probably four or 500 pounder. And finally this big old male polar bear said, no. And just stomped after him, just made a bluff charge at the grizzly bear. And that grizzly ran like a little puppy would run with his hind feet between his front feet. He was running so hard to try to get away from the big bad white guy. So that sort of interaction is really is really intriguing, and uh, the presence of grizzly bears and black bears in the in the system just adds to the predator guild. All of them eat snow geese. All of them eat eggs. Um, the polar bears are usually not as big a threat on the eggs because they oftentimes are not ashore before the snow geese hatch. Uh, polar bears take a much bigger toll on flightless birds. I think you probably saw it while you were up there. They, they actually chase the flightless snow geese flocks and run them into willows, much like we ran the birds into our nets at banding. And then they just run up and just start smashing them. And then they sit down and we'll eat 10 or 15 of them at a sitting and then move on to the next bunch. Um, I didn't see that. I saw them eating uh, eider eggs. As I remember okay. seeing that. Yeah. Yeah, well, they, they take a huge toll on snow geese every year doing that. Um, the last couple of years, the, the snow geese have really been, the population had gotten up to about 75,000 pairs. And uh, for the past, in, in the last two field seasons, so uh, field season 2019 and 2018 were very harsh years. The weather was horrid. Uh, spring, it was like spring was never coming. And when it did, uh, there was flooding and all of that sort of stuff. Uh, polar bears stayed out on the ice, but grizzly bears and black bears moved in. And in 2019, we had a grizzly and two black bears completely wiped out that area that you may remember called the Lakes District, which was just yeah. south of camp that usually has four or 500 nests in it. They, they just decimated it. There wasn't a single egg left. So you had a year with no polar bears ashore at all? Oh no, they come, but oh, they come after incubation. Oh, okay, usually. yeah, yeah. Uh, they're 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 usually there by the first of July. Um, yeah, but I, um, I know the year I was up, um, it was um, a late thaw, and I don't think they. I think they came. The first one we saw was July fifteenth. I have it actually in my field. In my, I keep horrible field notes, and it was it just be like the date. And it'd be like polar bear, <laughs> like that's it. <laughs> right. Well, I, I've I've recently gone through all of our notes and everything I could find because we tried to track down every observation of grizzly bears. I'm working with a guy named Doug Clark, who's at Saskatoon at the University of Saskatchewan, and um, he was um, got a contract. He used to work for Parks Canada, and he got a contract from the Manitoba government to do a study on, and basically put together um, the distribution of polar bears in the Cape Churchill Peninsula region. Polar bear, or sorry, grizzly bears. Grizzlies were once in Manitoba, but they were extirpated by the early settlers. And the ones that we have now are probably a different subspecies. These are guys that are originally from the Northwest Territories. Uh, come across Hit Hudson Bay, make a right turn, cross the Churchill River, somehow get past the town of Churchill without getting shot, and um, wind up in Wapask. And we've got pictures, and so he's used facial recognition software and some stuff that you can use on other parts of the body, scar recognition and stuff like that. And we've got since 19... Um, I think the first observation we had was 2006. Uh, there were some reports before that. Um, Doug has more faith in some of them than I do because I know some of the people that did the reports. And mm. it'd be, oh, a large brown blob ran past me. Eh, it could have been a moose because yeah. um, they were down in the boreal forest. But we got really good pictures in 2006 from the air. And since then, we've got I think the, the total is now 192 sightings. And it's um, as near as we can figure out, we've got at least 12 different individuals. And uh, one of the big concerns now for the National Park is 
uh, this this ironic situation where you have the grizzly bear, which was which is legally classified still as extirpated, and the polar bear, which is legally classified as threatened, and these guys have got to be denning in the same area. The male polar bears, as you recall, don't den, but the females that are going to have cubs den, and all of the grizzlies den. And the only place they can do that are along the river banks of the Broad River, the Owl River, Rupert Creek, and places like that. And there's only so many places you can den up. A uh, polar bear female uh, sleeps through the winter with her cubs and gets up in late March. Grizzly bears don't do a true hibernation. That's a bit of a myth. They sort of take a long nap for three or four weeks and then they get up and they go out and they scratch and they do this and they poke around and if they can find uh, lemmings to eat or if they can find ground squirrels or something like that, they'll do that. And the big fear is that they'll find a polar bear den with a sleeping female and her cubs in it and they'll become predators of polar bears because as far as a grizzly is concerned, uh, food is food. Um, so that's a huge concern and the National Park is trying to get the wherewithal to get some collars on the uh, grizzly bears, some satellite transmitting collars so they can actually figure out exactly where is it that these guys are denning. Um, and I mean, as you know, that's a huge park. So to travel even by snow machine or dog sled during the winter down in there, uh, you could go for days and days and days and not find the two or three grizzly bears that are out wandering around. They, Isn't Wapus like the size of Connecticut or Delaware or something? It's like oh, it's pretty much the size of of Connecticut, Rhode Island, and part of Massachusetts. It's a huge expanse of land, and um, all of this stuff where the the bears den and operate are in stands of thirty to fifty foot tall blue or uh, black spruce and white spruce trees that's pretty dense. So they've tried going in with, um, they, they, they're, they're thinking, they're trying to get the money together. The National Park is trying to get the money to go in with uh, LIDAR and FLUOR on the helicopters, which are thermal imaging detectors. And in, in theory, you can detect a bear hibernating even if it's under snow with um, a combination of LIDAR and FLUOR. And they're, they're going to try to do that and then GPS those locations and then send people down and try to figure out what the hell is inside those dens, which is, that'd be sort of fun. They put a, you know, a little camera thing on the end of a pole and poke it down yeah. in and with an IR light on it or something like IR source and uh, try to see what's inside and hope it doesn't come charging out at you. So um, uh, that would be just the kind of thing I would enjoy doing. But, yeah. <laughs> We'll see if I can get involved in that or not. Um, right now, I'm just sort of an advisor on that project. But we continue. We've also continued with our uh, work on the eider colony. Uh, the eider colony's also gone through some tough times because of, of weather and because of predators. As uh, the eiders, eiders are, are really the sitting duck because they are so docile. Uh, the foxes and the wolves in particular prey on them very heavily and um, the bears have done them no favors either. And we're a little concerned that, that, both, species, that both species are um, going to do this number where they stop being quite as philopatric to the area. Mm. Because, you know, you can only make the stupid goose or the stupid duck assumption so many times. Yeah. Um, yes, geese are philopatric. Yes, ducks are philopatric. They go back to where they were hatched to nest, but um, how many times you go back if you fail? And you don't go back at all if you get eaten. So uh, I'm not exactly sure what the fate of the colony will be. I, I honestly think that if the predator guild continues to grow and it has shown no signs of declining because there's a near infinite supply of food, the caribou herd has gotten huge. Um, there's lots of fish, there's lots of berries. There's lots of things that uh, grizzly bears and black bears both really like to eat. So that will probably keep going for some time. And I feel that that kind of predator pressure is just gonna to be too much for the bird populations. 
which in a sense might be good for the park because it would allow habitat recovery. So I sort of look at it as over a 60, 70 year time span, we'll go full cycle. Uh, We've got some really good evidence. That's the other thing. Um, I know you said that you're interested in, in botany and in things like that. We've gotten into another huge study where we've put up recovery exclosures, where we've gone into areas that are <clears throat> completely denuded and just put up exclosures to see well, what, what will come back and over what time course. And in certain areas where the geese have been hammering it for 30 or 40 years, uh, 20 years later, there still is nothing coming back. Some of those exclosures were set up when you were there. But we set up other ones uh, back towards a place we call Big Ass Lake which was denuded over about a 10 year time span. And we, we now have 100% recovery of, of graminoids and we're now getting uh, willows and all sorts of stuff coming back in those exposures. So the, the areas will return as long as they don't get hammered too long and even those ultimately return. So um, my advice to the National Park, because they are mandated to um, maintain the park in its original pristine condition, whatever that means. Um, But it probably doesn't mean the way it looked when you were there after the snow goose damage. Uh, It probably doesn't mean they have to reintroduce velociraptors or anything like (laughs) that. But it would be nice to get vegetation growing again. And my advice to them is that I don't think you need to do anything drastic at the moment because I think the population of snow geese um, is going to come under control uh, hunting efforts in the mid-continent are still not successful. The mid-continent population is still growing um, much greater than we thought it would. And that's in part because hunters are not harvesting as much as we had hoped. And you can't blame them because there's a lot more geese than we wanted. And people can only eat so many snow geese. Uh, friends in Churchill that lobbied hard for the right for um, white people to hunt snow geese in the spring when they finally got their wish i was all over one of them i said why don't you paul why don't you hunt more snow geese he looked at me he said i bring home 180 snow geese a year if i walk through the door with one more snow geese my wife and children will leave (laughs) and i agree snow goose is good but you can only eat so much of it yeah i think the fact that the predators have now shifted and this shift in predator gills with the grizzly bears and especially with the black bears uh, responding to climate change uh, both of those moving into Wapuska is a climate change induced thing the black bears have moved north because more of the berries that they like have moved north with climate change and the grizzlies what happened with them is in the center of the northwest territories of the Yukon climate change has brought about a lot healthier berry crop and stuff like that. So you have higher survival of juvenile grizzly bears. The population has gotten really large. And grizzly bears, unlike black bears or polar bears that are sort of, sort of willing to live shoulder to shoulder, grizzly bears are not. And they, they like their space. And so that's why they expanded. And they couldn't go north for fear of hitting more polar bears. And they couldn't go west because there's already too many grizzly bears. Uh, for some reason, he didn't go south. Well, he went somewhat south. Uh, there's a lot more grizzly bears now down in the Canadian parks along the border and in the American parks. But they went east and they hit Hudson Bay and then they moved down and that's where they came from. So the expansion of both grizzlies and black bears into the Cape Churchill Peninsula area are both consequences of climate change. Um, you know, that Chinese hoax that we aren't supposed to talk about. <laughs> um, <laughs> but... Um, so anyway, that's that's sort of a, a synopsis of everything that's going on up there. We've still got lots of projects. I've got periodically people come in. I've got a colleague now that's come in. You would be very excited to meet. He's um, stud- re- he's reopened the Savannah Sparrow Project and, oh. yellow warb- and started a yellow warbler project where they're uh, banding and color marking those and studying density and studying nesting density in good habitat versus well, let's say in bad habitat versus a better habitat, because uh, I don't think there's any really good habitat right around the camp. Uh, the only thing that hasn't made a comeback, which I miss immensely, is we've, we've never, the ptarmigan population has never recovered. Oh, it went through a collapse. It went through a collapse. Um, there was some 
something that whacked the willows one year. So there wasn't a lot of food for the willow ptarmigan and their numbers went way down. I also think the high number of foxes that we have probably doesn't help because foxes are very adept at finding ptarmigan nests. Yeah, well, I would think, I mean, it could be a, if you were getting, if the foxes and wolves are feeding on, um, they're feeding on the geese, right? And, and it may have helped decrease their numbers, but what are they going to feed on when the geese are south? Exactly. Ptarmigan, yeah. Ptarmigan. Yeah. Ptarmigan, ptarmigan, and more ptarmigan. And so that's, that's part of the problem. I remember and, um, uh, how annoying the ptarmigan were when, when I was there, where they would be doing that crazy, you know, chicken like crazy you know noise on the top of our quantit hut while we're trying to sleep and of course right. there's not really any darkness so it could be any any time <laughs> right and raking those long toenails on the gravel yeah that that was the noise that used to drive me crazy i could i could put up with their calls i sort of like bagow yeah but it was the toenails racing across the uh shingle or the, the tar the gravel tar <laughs> paper three feet over my head that would drive me crazy yeah gone are those days sir we have all brand new buildings with metal roofs and all of that kind of stuff oh really wow yeah that was well is the shower building that chris with a little bit of our help built still there the shower the shower building is still there it's got a new roof on it the quonset was replaced the bob was replaced um the cook shack is jacked up. All of these buildings are now uh, at least four feet off the ground because we're getting tidal surges. Oh, wow. <clears throat> I, got, I got tired of coming in the spring and finding a foot of ice on the floor of every building. So we now have the buildings at three feet. And this spring, um, we came close to taking on water. Oh, wow. Uh, between the really incredible snow melt and flooding actually it was two years ago two years ago they had these massive floods that took out the churchill railway and so churchill was out without rail service for over a year wow and um the, to put this in context for people who, who aren't familiar um the camp uh, you've been running for several it was 50 years now um <clears throat> is in wapas national park which is near the city well the little town of churchill but there's right. no road to the park, right? The road. No, 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 no. The the camp and the park are 30 miles. The, the 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 westernmost border of the park is 30 miles east of the town of Churchill, and we are on the northwest corner of the park. That's La Perouse Bay, and that's the beginning of the Cape Churchill Peninsula, and the Cape Churchill Peninsula goes from Watson Point, which is the beginning of La Perouse Bay, east about seven miles to Cape Churchill, sort of northeast. To Cape Churchill, and then it shoots south all the way down to um, York Factory, where the Hayes and Nelson rivers come in. And that whole giant region is Wapas National Park. And um, about, I'm going to say 20% of it is coastal tundra. And then you have highlands, which are these giant raised uh, lichen form formations. And then about 40% of it is true boreal forest, where you have all sorts of lakes and uh, moose and all sorts of stuff. And I've done some work. You would have been uh, very jealous to it and would have loved to have gone along on some of those trips. We got oh, yeah. money to, to do some of the uh, bird inventory work. And altogether, we've got, I think we've got 280 species of birds that we've noted for Wapos National oh, Park. Wow. The uh, trip down into the boreal forest was stellar for me because it was the first time I got to see um, boreal owls, hawk owls, and great gray owls. So we got all three of those on that trip. Um, as you recall, I'm much more interested and impressed by large birds than small birds. Yeah. <laughs> um, the fellow that I had with me was one of my students from New York who's a, a rabbit bird watcher, and he was just going nuts with the... Uh, with the birds we found. Um, but we found an, an amazing array of birds. Uh, we've got uh, yellow rails. We found two spots that have got yellow rails. You could step on them. There were so many yellow rails. Well, I'd hear them at night at the camp, which is yeah. interesting to have <clears throat> them that far, you know, into the tundra. Um, you know, it's a really, I saw an interesting um, study of uh, golden eagles that were banded 
and put with a, and they put cellular trackers on them in, in Wapus. Were you involved with that at all? No, I was aware of the work, but I wasn't involved yeah. with that project. That's that was part cool. of that was part of that was there was, there had been a huge debate um, that I had gotten myself involved in over whether there actually were golden eagles in Wapus National Park, um, and what a number of the park parkies were calling golden eagles were actually immature bald eagles. Yeah. Um, because as you know, the markings can be very confusing with the juveniles. It's sort of a flip and reverse kind of thing. The, the, the plumage of a juvenile golden eagle is almost more like an adult bald eagle and the flip. And I finally figured that out with some pictures where I came back to the museum and I got specimens. We've got some specimens of both species that instead of being in the, the standard little, uh, curled up like this form or actually with their wings out. And I put them on the ground, both top side up and bottom side up so I could see what they look like. And the grand old man of rep raptor biology at the museum, uh, Dean Amidon, showed up and wanted to, I mean, that's what he studied. And he wanted to know, why do you have my eagles on the floor? And why are you standing on that table? And I said, well, I wanted to see what they look like from above. And he said, why in the hell would anybody want to see what a golden or a bald eagle looks like from above? You don't see them from above. I said, well, you do if you're in a helicopter. Yeah. And he said, huh, never thought of that. Help me up there. So I helped him <laughs> up onto the table. And he pointed out to me the exact things to look for yeah. from the top. And we finally decided we did some flights down into the very heavy boreal area. And we found some nesting golden eagles. And I think that was the impetus behind that project. There were some people in Western Canada that I think that did that work. I'm not sure. Yeah, because if you look at like a lot of ranger maps, it there would be like the population that breeds up in like Quebec and in Labrador, and then there'd be the population like Northwest Territories, and there'd be this gap along the southern Hudson Bay. And and I think that like, you know. It's been a stat. I mean, it's just no one's there. It's so remote that no one probably, you know. So. Right. I think that's part of it, and and the other part is you have people that go in that don't really know birds. I mean, I've I've always insisted with the national park when they do these little um, exploration trips of theirs, where they take two or three of the parkies and put them in canoes and send them down the Owl River and so on and so forth, that they should always take an experienced birder with them. I said, yeah. I could give you a list of birders who would pay their own expenses to get to Churchill to do that job for you for free. And you should do that because if you're gonna go down there and spend federal money on these little adventures, you should take people down that can actually collect the correct information. Yeah. And, uh, you can imagine how that went over. <laughs> <laughs> I would, um, you know, I mean, I got a kid on the way and I have a job, but I would, Oh, I'm, it, it, I'm willing you know, to bet that if I could get you a two-week stint in a canoe in the Owl River in I'd Central find the, I'd find Park, the way. you'd find the time. I'd find the way, and I'd brave those bugs. Well, um, you've, you've always been on my list as a possibility for that. There's two or three people that have been at the camp over the years um, that have got the birding skills that would be necessary to do that job that I think would have the interest and also, uh, I wouldn't want to send somebody that um, I hadn't already exposed to how to deal with yeah. not being afraid of polar bears. Uh, Do you know what's interesting? Um, and, you know, man, we, I, I think we got, yeah, we got about five minutes left or so. Um, I don't want to compare what I've done to what – the military people in the military experience but from doing two trips up north and in a, a remote field camp it made me just understand i think a little bit of what to go through and i would have to magnify it by a million but i would have nightmares about polar bears when i came back down south you know like like just like tony tony i've done this for 51 years 51 years and i still have nightmares about polar bears all the time. Yeah. I know I know I have nightmares about grizzly bears because I had one way too close encounter with one two years ago. And also when I would get back to civilization, um, like when we got back from camp to because we the camp is 
far away from the study center. And, oh, yeah. you know, there's no road in between. And you get to the study center, and suddenly there's a whole college class there. Full, and I was, you know, in my late, my mid-late 20s, and there's, you know, women in their young 20s. I was scared to death of, of them. Because I was like, I haven't talked to anybody but the five of us in, um, in two months. And then you see when I got back to, to Fairbanks from when I was out in Alaska, I didn't want to talk to anybody for like days. And then I felt normal again. But I'm like, man, I can't imagine going to a place where you're getting shot at for a year. And, right. and then you have to come back home. I can't, I can't, you know, if just go and do something really fun and cool in the art. I mean, again, there's danger. It's a chopper could crash, could get eaten by a polar bear. You know, uh, there are some legitimate dangers, but nothing compared to being in combat. And just the, that, how that changed the way, you know, I would dream and, and how I felt was, was, was crazy. Well, one of, the, one of the things that goes along with it, which you, you probably don't know that I've gone through, is um, in the early 2000s, I was having trouble sleeping and all this kind of stuff here at home. And um, I contacted an old student of mine who's a psychiatrist and talked to him about it. It turns out his, he's an expert on PTSD. And he did the diagnosis, and I suffer from that. And I said, I don't really understand. I've not been in combat, and so on and so forth. And he said, what's the last thing you do every night when you're in the camp? And I said, I make sure there's a round in my shotgun, and I sleep with it on my chest. And he said, you're an intelligent guy. You, 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 you don't realize why you're stressed? <laughs> he said, good Lord, think about this. And I think the, the, the thing that people don't understand, and one of the reasons that I always go south for a few few days, and any of my people that are going to be up there for more than two years, they start getting a trip at least into town, if not into south, to, to break out of that so that you aren't out there in that pressure cooker nonstop. Uh, keep in mind, when I first started doing this, we went up there in mid to early April, wow. and we didn't come home until September, and we were totally isolated the whole time, and there would just be four or five of us. and. Um, so it, it, it wears on people. And I think that um, my advice to everybody that thinks about doing research in remote field camps is that you have to be mindful of that. There's a level of stress uh, in the camp, which is why, as you know, in, my, in our camp, there's also a level of tomfoolery and there's a level of practical joking and there's always a lot of good food and there's always alcohol and so on and so forth. And part of that is just to break through that stress. Yeah. Uh, we, we today have even more formalized that we have um, dinner as a required activity. Everybody has to be there. Everybody has to participate. And it starts with cocktails. Mm -hmm. And we formalized it. So everybody has to be in by a certain time. We, I make a giant bowl of popcorn, usually two or three giant bowls of popcorn. Everybody breaks out their favorite libation, and we tell stories about the day. You changed my life for many ways, but one of them was I didn't drink before I went up there because when I first got into punk rock and whatnot, it was kind of like you either didn't do anything or you were a disaster. So I didn't right. drink until I was in my late 20s. Um, you, you were like, I think it was the – anniversary of your father's death or something and you're like i'm gonna have yep. a toast to everybody i I'd, I'd love you to join me and i was like well i'll, I'll just try it. i'll just have a i'll do one shot and for camp morale sake and camaraderie and it'd be fine i took a sip of that black bush irish whiskey and i was like where have you been all my life <laughs> I was just like, and I was like, well there was there was a second thing that i did that changed your life um, remember the first night you were there, you had told me you were a vegetarian, but you would figure it out. I said, oh, fine, whatever. Yeah. And I made a giant meat chili and I offered to make a non-meat version. You said, no, no, I'll just have what everybody else is having. Yeah. And I remember you had to clear a path to get to the outhouse because having gone however many years it was without eating meat and then eating a spicy meat chili was probably a real coming of age for your insides. Um, I didn't make it. Uh, and luck. And, I remember. And luck. And so I had to use snow and um, um, baby wipes um, to deal with this horrific situation. Uh, that's, that's, that's field. But I learned something, you know, like I'm a, it felt weird to be there studying animals and everything's eating everything else. 
<laughs> there's no real I – mean, even if you're a vegetarian animal, you're not really because you're eating the insects no. and inverts on the food. It's, it just felt <clears> weird. <throat> and, and I'm a good cook, so it felt weird of like I'll cook for everybody but not know what it tastes like. No. I'll, so, yeah. So have you, have, you remade, have you gone back to being a vegetarian? No. No. I'm a – So you're the – I think there's – over the years, I've had about 10 people that started as vegetarians that – and there's only one of them. There's one woman who's um, – very, very religious Indian, and she remains a vegetarian to this day. She did try bacon one time, but mm. just just for actually, she had tofu, and the deal was that I would eat some of her tofu if she ate some of my bacon, and so we each ate, ate some of the other. <laughs> but um, she has remained true to form. But everybody else that's ever been up there that started as a vegetarian. Yeah, it it only takes about a week in the camp, and you go like, "Wow, the meat tastes so good." Yeah, as you put it, you're like, often you never get truly warm. You no. know, like like like, even like you know, um, so it's nice to have that you know fat in your system. <laughs> you know, well, it's 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 like the one thing you don't find. I I've traveled to a lot of northern native communities over the over the years, and the one thing you don't find are vegetarians in northern communities. Yeah. I mean, it, it's simply that you can't stay warm enough, even though you can do the, this, this Indian woman used to argue that there's the same calories in olive oil that there is in bacon fat. And I go, yeah, but your body doesn't metabolize it the same way. Yeah. And, and that's true. The human, you can, you can get the same caloric value with a bomb calorimeter, but your body is not a bomb calorimeter. Right. And, um, so it, it's funny most of the people that, um, like like this woman, she is now doing research back in India where it's nice and warm, and that's where her comfort zone is. <clears throat> but I, I don't know anybody that's started as a vegetarian that still works in the Arctic that's not become a carnivore. Yeah. Well, I, I think I went back to mostly vegetarian, and then I went back to Alaska, ate meat again, and um, three uh, – weeks after getting back from alaska i went to brazil for three and a half months and i was just like and after that i was like never i never went back to even i was just like i am a mediator now <laughs> you know, like, like, right yeah you should have gone instead of brazil you should have gone to argentina then you would have never looked at vegetables again right but i was in southern brazil mostly which is very similar okay. uh barbecue culture there it was incredible i mean literally the the, the family i befriended they actually came up to my wedding and so um you know their house, they, there's a, you know, like a barbecue built into their kitchen. Like, like it's just like a separate thing. It's like, that's how important that is to that culture. Um, right. So, well, the, the average Argentine consumes over a pound of meat per day per person. <laughs> yeah, I'd have been in Northern Argentina briefly too, and it was delicious. Um, well, I think uh, Zoom's going to kick me off soon. Um, Rocky, this has been awesome. It's been great catching up with you. Great hearing your story. I'm glad I'm getting to, to share it. Um, are you... Are you ever going to write a book about your experiences up there? Because it, it, <clears throat> yeah, someday, someday. Yeah. I'm, I'm still, I'm still got too many science papers I want to write. I know to, to spend time on memoirs. Yeah, I, I do, I do memoirs this way. There's a, actually, there's a colleague at the museum that put together a movie that's not completely finished with the editing. That's all about me and the camp and what we do and stuff like that. So. I figure that and podcasts like what you're going to do. And if you can send me a link to it, you get it. Absolutely, up, I, it. I will. It should be um, up soon. Yeah. And um, let's let's try to let's try to stay a little bit more in close touch. We're not that far apart. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> and now you live. What part of Philadelphia do you live in? You said you live in this the edge. I live in Roxborough. Edge. Yeah, the northwest Rocks edge, Ro Roxborough. Are you familiar with the Wissahickon Park or Chestnut Hill? Yeah. Yeah, yeah Chestnut. Okay. The, the park is in between. So the park is in between Chestnut Hill and Roxborough. Um, okay, well, well, a few my, neighborhoods. My, si my sister in law lives down towards. Um, I forget the name of it now. Westchester. Yeah, well, she lives in the. Yeah, so that's not that far. No, it's like in forty-five minutes, the most. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, next time I'm going to be down there, or if you're going to be up in the city, once I start going back in the city, I don't have any real plans to go back probably until January. Yeah. I may yeah. go in. For, I may go in for a few times. Do you ever go to the academy when you're when you're in town? No, not I really don't. Yeah, I have friends there too. So if you want to stop by and say hi to them and look at their collection for whatever reason, you know. Yeah, um, but 
the the museum is still i mean locked down tight yeah and um i think that i mean one of the things i've been doing here as a contribution for my little town is uh, and that's what the call that rang was uh we're tracking the, the spread of the virus in connecticut and in the local towns and stuff like that and trying to do some modeling on it and m my best guess is that we're my wife and I are still going to isolate ourselves probably through the middle of June. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, simply because I don't feel that it's, um, the numbers have gone down a lot in Connecticut. They've gone down a lot, a lot in Reading, Connecticut, but it's not over. Yeah. And as soon as social distancing stops, we're going to see blips. Uh, Dr. Burks pointed out correctly that those, various protesters in Michigan, Kentucky, and so on and so forth, you're going to see huge upticks. They've already got an uptick in Kentucky, and they just announced yesterday that there's a huge uptick in Oklahoma, um, five days after all the protests. Yeah. And that doesn't surprise me at all. Um, this is, a, uh, as you may remember, my, this is part of what my wife does. She was originally trained in micro. And um, this is a really peculiar bug. Um, I had a PhD student that I worked on virus transmissions and stuff like that. He was working on um, HIV, which is what we refer to as a highly intelligent virus in the sense that it, it spreads um, before it kills its host. In contrast to Ebola, which is a very stupid virus because it's so hot it kills before it can spread. Well, this is on the HIV side of the world. This is a very, very intelligent virus. It spreads uh, very quickly. It stays on surfaces. Those little dumbbell things it's got really make it nasty, mm. hard to get rid of, hard for the body to process and stuff like that. So I think this is something that people shouldn't take lightly. And I, I really think that this has been so mismanaged by the federal government that it's, it's pathetic. Yeah, is, is the word I would use. It's it's pathetic. And you canceled and your whole field season because of it. Yep. I canceled the field season. Yeah. Um, the, well, the Wapask right now is Wapask is closed and the Canadian border is closed. But I canceled the field season before either of those events happened out of um, concern for my students. And the fact that, as I said earlier, um, there's no way I could guarantee getting them down there in time or getting them out on in time if somebody became sick. Yeah, that's crazy times. Uh, and crazy thing to end on, but I guess we should because uh, I think Zoom's going to keep you off in a minute. Uh, Rocky, it's been a real pleasure. We'll keep in touch. It's, been, <clears throat> it's really been good keeping or getting in touch with you again, Tony. Yeah. I, I enjoyed you immensely when you were in camp. I learned a lot from you as well. So you Thank have you so fun. much. Good luck on the new baby when it arrives. And uh, maybe you can set up a Zoom when that happens and I can see it. Will do. Absolutely. And everybody, please like and subscribe on your podcasting uh, or, or YouTube, you know, your platform of choice. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Rocky. And we shall be in touch. Okay. Yeah. Send me a link. We'll do. Cheers. Bye-bye.